jinkies. I can't find my glasses. <laughs> like Amala. <laughs> Gotta find your glasses. Ruh <laughs> row. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys! Dang it! I'm it's trying. really hard to it do. It was much better shaggy. before the podcast. It was much started. better yeah, before we started, one. and yeah. then Amala sucked at it. Well, it I did suck. I was doing a really good Velma, and it was like I was doing a really good live action Velma, and then I lost like, it. Like wow, Scooby! According to my calculations, we have switched souls. That's our Shaggy, <laughs> Scooby, and da- Velma. Or Jin- <laughs> Velma Jinkies. Anyways, guys, we have some fantastic stories for you today. Maybe not so fantastic once you hear them, but the, they will uh, definitely elicit some sort of response for you. Our first one uh, is speaking to what we've been talking about on this stream for a really long time, and that's the infiltration of this horrible leftist ideology in our public institutions and in our schools. So this one is going to probably be very drawing for you. It was for Will. He will confirm this as we get into talking about it. Oh, yeah. But I want to show you this article here called uh, The Psycho... The psychopathic problem of the white mind. Now, sounds good already. It already sounds great. We're already setting uh, setting us up for success. So, what happened was Yale had a talk uh, at their campus called the psychopathic problem of the white mind. It was delivered by uh, a speaker here at the Yale School of Music Child Study Center, and she is a New York-based psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. And I just want to go over some of the things she had to say during this talk here. So, here are some quotes from this. Wait, you can play the audio. Play the audio. I'm going to play the audio yeah, for Yeah, play the audio. Okay. Stuff's you crazy. You want to hear this in, in live, real time. Indispensable for calling out injustice yeah. wherever it is. 6.45 here. A confirmation that when she charged me cash money for years, and then she'd attempt to, quote, teach me because she had concern about my anger. I couldn't get her to shut the fuck up. This is the cost of talking to white people at all. The cost of your own life is they stuff you dry. There are no good apples out there. White people make my blood boil. Around five. Yeah, if you did not hear what she just said, I'll read the quote for you. This is the cost of talking to white people at all. The cost of your own life as they suck you dry. There are no good apples out there. White people make my blood boil. Do you feel sucked dry talking to me? <laughs> No, I feel I feel pretty alive talking That's to you. Good. That's good. That's good. I'm glad. <laughs> I don't feel sucked dry at all. I want to play, play another. Play seven seventeen. Yes, we're gonna play another quote for you. Very incendiary here. It was also public service. I had fantasies of unloading a revolver into the head of any white person that got in my way, daring their body to do something that they would not do. And wiping my bloody hands as I walked away relatively gently. Would have done something like that. Did you hear that one? Because she said, I had fantasies of unloading a revolver into the head of any white person that got in my way, burying their body and wiping my bloody hands as I walked away, relatively guiltless with a bounce in my step. This chick is crazy. (laughs) This is crazy. This chick is psycho. This is a psycho chick. If you meet a girl like this, fellas, and she starts saying some stuff like this, she ain't the one. (laughs) She's not. She's one. not the one. I don't this think she's anybody's crazy. one. I, I would highly doubt that she's married. She might be, but poor man, whoever has to be married to this woman. This chick is insane. She's crazy. I mean, you can go in and you can try and break down like the socioeconomic and like political weirdness of all the things she's saying and try and break it down like as a smart person. But it's like, dude, this chick sucks. This chick is crazy. Right. She's coming on here saying that she wants to kill all white people because they're white and gets heralded for it, is allowed to say this. This is like... This is complete racism. Imagine if you had a black or a white person come on and say, you know, I just I have fantasies about killing all black people and putting revolvers to their head if they get in my way. What would happen? You would be killed. You would be you would never be able to get a job anywhere again. And I doubt anything like that is going to happen. Oh, yeah. If you weren't physically killed, you would be socially exiled for the rest of your life for saying something like that. Yet it is seemingly okay when you get to use this rhetoric towards white people. Why? (laughs) Because the left perceives that white people have some sort of power over them within the society and that white people can never truly understand the plight that it is to be a person of color. And that's the sort of ideology that is now being pushed in our schools. This is commonplace. This is this may sound crazy. This may sound super outlandish because she is being extremely violent and extremely aggressive with her language. But the underlying foundation of this sort of rhetoric, the underlying foundation of this sort of belief that white people have some sort of privilege, some sort of power that we need to take away from them, that we need to to destroy 
is a commonly held belief on the left. Again, almost every single day on this show. Again, we go live every single day on weekdays, 2.30 p.m. PST, 5.30 p.m. Eastern. Guys yeah. tune in every single day. Uh, but every single time that we do this program, we usually talk about something in colleges or something happening at a university or a public school, high school, whatever it might be, about some teacher being a loon. And then people will hear them in the comments or whatever, and they'll just be like, it's just one teacher. Like, it doesn't really matter. It's like, you understand that we're doing this show, first of all, every single day. There's something new at a different university every single day happening with some crazy professor. Who knows how many people this woman has influenced? And also, who knows how many of these things are happening where someone is saying this, where it's not being recorded or it's not being brought to the light. I mean, these things are happening on college campuses all the time. And I, I think this woman in particular is very proud of the things she's saying, and so she's not so worried about the public backlash of what would happen. But I think that a lot of university professors, when they say some of these things, they don't want them to be recorded because I think that they know that they're delusional and that if it came to the light, they would be embarrassed by the things that they're saying. Their parents didn't raise them this way. No. This is something that has to be taught by universities. Right. And that's the thing with the radical left is they're loud and they are proud to be saying this. She expresses no guilt, no remorse in these sort of statements that she's saying. And that's because the people who are on the stream left, the extreme left, the people who are the most extreme, the most left are the loudest ones in the room. And if you don't start to call out this sort of stuff and stop it at its root, it is going to keep happening. And for white people, what are you supposed to do with rhetoric like this? How do you solve this problem when people like this just hate you inherently there's nothing that you can do and in fact this this speaker this psychiatrist this psychoanalyst psychiatrist says, or yeah. Psychopath. <laughs> yeah, I guess she's both. She she's she knows exactly what she's studying. Takes one to know one, I guess. This is wild. So she goes on to say in her in her talk. We need to remember that directly talking about race to white people is useless because they are at the wrong level of conversation. Addressing racism assumes that white people can see and process what we are talking about. They can't. That's why they sound demented. They don't even know they have a mask on. White people think that it's their actual face. We need to let them know that they have a mask on. First of all, I never wear my mask. <laughs> I go into grocery stores. I have to be told to wear my mask, first of all. What what the hell does this even mean, that we're wearing a mask or that we can't see the things that they're seeing? We are just as much a part of this world seeing everything going on just as much as everyone else. I am the same as Amla. We view the world the same. We have similar ideas because we are able to look at things beyond race. We can look at the world around us in the political landscape and the cultural landscape and say, this makes sense. This doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter if Amla's black. It doesn't matter if I'm white. I'm able to look at the world no matter what just because of that's the way the world is not out of the lens that i am a white person looking right. at it right it, it's complete racism and you know what i always like it the funny thing is does the left get tired do their arms get tired moving the goalpost every two seconds because that's exactly <laughs> what they're doing like the left said before okay well if, if you're not black you don't speak on black issues you let us handle it we'll tell you what to do we'll tell you what right what's right and as a white person the only thing you need to do is not be racist okay that was goalpost number one the goalpost number two was okay you can't talk about race you can't be racist but now you have to be anti-racist as a white person you have to actively be working to be against racism every single day okay white people said okay i'll do that for you the white left especially and then the left goes no that's not enough either you're not you're not even uh cognizant enough to have a conversation about race anymore so just see your way out of it you're wearing a mask you're no longer human now we have to kill you right now now <laughs> you have to die yeah it's like you um, it's like they want a white genocide. I mean, it's crazy. And again, people will say, I've been saying this for a long time. When, when we say stuff like this, they're like, you're overreacting. This isn't really happening. It's like, go to a university and tell me that that's not happening. Go to one no. of these courses. I mean, I, I in my college, uh, before I dropped out, there was a course that I was going to take, but it dropped out. But it was about problematizing whiteness, how whiteness has like destroyed America. This was back at uh, CU. Uh, I mean, there are all of these things happening all over the nation, all right. of the time. It's wild. Right. I get asked a lot, did you lose any friends when you became a conservative? And there's one friend that always sticks out to me that I did lose is coming out as a conservative. But this friend in particular echoed a lot of the same sentiments as th that this woman is talking about here. She did it publicly, no remorse, no shame. She would walk around and see white people and just say like, Nazi, Nazi alt-right deserves to die she would say things like oh well now we need to have a genocide and this time we need to make it white this is a commonly held belief that's wild isn't that crazy <laughs> i was walking i went to the farmer's market yesterday in la and sometimes at the farmer's market on sundays they'll have these people who are set up with their communist stuff mm -hmm. they have like communist rallies in la and they're trying to get people to be communist right and so i just walked by and i they got very mad at me and hated me i had my manga hat on and that, sure. i just said you know 
power to the people. <laughs> I said capitalism is the best and walked by and they started screaming at me while I was running away. It was it was great. Right. But I'm saying like people have these like weird beliefs and things that you take from a lens of everyone's racist. The world is super unfair. I can't make it. Uh, it sucks because I am this race and someone else is this. They have these wildly health held beliefs that aren't that aren't based in any sort of fact or reason or logic. And so that when people actually take a step back and look at something like this chick is saying, you're like, this is crazy. This is racism. This, right. this is, these are horrible things that were used centuries ago to justify people being killed for their race, for black people being killed for their race, for Jews being killed for their ethnicity. I mean, right. all of these different things were used as justification. This is exactly what that sounds like. It sounds like the exact same thing, but for some reason in the radical world of the left, these things are heralded while the other ones are looked down upon. Upon. They should right. all be looked down upon. They're all racism. They're all evil. And some lady saying this, this lady should not have a platform to come and say this. This is not, I mean, even in the, the uh, First Amendment sense, if you are threatening someone with right. your with your ideas or your speech, then, you know, that is, that is not with the First Amendment. That doesn't uh, classify as covered under the First Amendment. So... I don't know. This this chick is wild. But they put the cute little veil over it that we're 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 being restorative. We're committing social justice in this sort of speaking. We're not doing anything wrong. We are simply we are uh, relearning. We are teaching you to relearn and unlearn the things that you knew before. And we need to revise what you've always known because white people have power, and we need to strip them of that to make ourselves equal. Crazy. I and don't if like you, it. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> I don't and like it as like my go-to phrase. It is your go-to go phrase. phrase. We need to get a t-shirt that's just Will's face and underneath it it says, I don't like it. <laughs> you can use it for everything. <laughs> it it works true. all the time. I don't like it. And if you think that this is, again, uh, we say this every time. We said this when we talked about the professor over at Cornell. If you think it is only happening here, that is not the case. I have another video for you to show that documents exactly that. This is <coughs> Professor Dr. Sam Richards at Penn State echoing a very similar sentiment in regard to white people and critical race theory. Here we go. And so what I find is that those kinds of ideas are really silencing. So if you're sitting in a group and you're sort of pissed, it's like Sam shouldn't have done this and he shouldn't have done that and he should approach this differently and he shouldn't talk about these issues like that and he's making people feel uncomfortable and he's all these things and you're white, what's actually happening is you're lifting yourselves up, right? Like you're lifting up because what you're doing by doing that is silencing a conversation that we need to have. Oh, don't talk about these issues. Oh, don't talk about them like that. Well, how do we talk about them? Pause. And he does this very same thing that this prior woman did, that if you're white and you get uncomfortable by me calling you out and, and echoing your, priv your privilege, all you're doing is trying to silence a conversation that we're trying to have. Getting up on the table, what a spectacle. <laughs> what a guy. He, wait, wait, wait. he was talking about if Sam is black in this, Sam. in this scenario. Oh, he's Sam. Yes. And Sam is doing something annoying to him. He's like, if I get up up here and I call you out for your white privilege and I try to have a conversation about race and you get uncomfortable and you state that you're uncomfortable, all you're doing is trying to silence the situation, silence the conversation. That's just a way to control people. That's not a way to have a decent conversation if someone right. disagrees with you. It's like, I disagree with you on white privilege. Can I have that conversation? No, you're just trying to silence the conversation. It's like, no, I disagree with you. Will you talk to me about it? It's like, no, you're silencing the conversation it's like <laughs> dude just talk about the issues and like have an honest discussion you don't see many of these leftist people who talk about this stuff have genuine debates with people who are on the other side of the issue no. it's always in a vacuum which is in a university class in an hr department of some company uh at a, at a public school anything like that but you don't see these people going out and really being challenged on their views this is why Again, I say this all the time, the conservatives, if you're in one of these places, if you're at a university, you're at a news station, you're at some company where there are there are HR departments that are totally leftist, you need to be in there telling them everything that you believe in and right. fighting back against these people. That's the only way that it gets better. And then everyone sits here and like complains about that, like, oh, things are getting worse. It's like you need to stand up and say something about it. If you're seeing this happen in your school, whatever, say something about it. If you're a kid in this class and you're seeing a professor say these things or you're at that uh, Yale thing and you see this person talking about this, like go and complain to your dean and right. tell them this is horrible there's a difference between a, a, a difference of opinion like someone having leftist ideas or explaining them to you and saying okay here is that idea versus someone trying to indoctrinate you and put these ideas and say no you can't even fight back against it because that means that you're silencing the conversation speak out against these things
Right. I, I'm sure there's some level of sort of bystander effect that happens here where everything is just so ridiculous that you expect somebody to do something. You expect somebody else to say it and you expect that, that person does not have to be you. But right now it does have to be you. Look at the hundreds of students here sitting in this lecture hall listening to this man ramble on about uh, uh, white privilege and white power. And it's just absolutely ridiculous. And nobody speaks up and says anything, as we'll see in the rest of this video. Yeah, but don't like start calling people out and pointing out their skin color. Oh, really? What should we do then? Oh, we shouldn't talk about skin color. Oh, I get it. Oh, well, let's not talk about hair. Let's not talk about anything. Let's not talk about people who don't, who, for whom English is not their first language. Let's not talk about accents and dialects and all sorts of, let's not talk about anything. Let's just pretend that nothing exists. And then when we pretend that nothing exists, power doesn't ever move. Power stays the same. In the world of race, what it means is white people continue to be empowered because white people never have to look in the mirror and say, wow, what's going on? We don't have to wrestle. We don't have to engage. Good Lord. See, this is how the left breaks down people in this country. Right. The left says, you speak a different language than me, let's talk about it. You have a different skin color than me, let's talk about it. A different dialect, a different accent, you're not from this country, like, let's talk about it. That is what defines you. I hope that my whiteness does not define me. Right. I want my ideas to define me. I want the things that I talk about here on stream. I want the things that are in my book. I want the things that I do in my other videos. I want those types of things to define me, the way I act in my life. I hope that defines me much more than someone just looking at me and saying, that person's white, so they have a certain definition about them. Or Amla, I don't want people to look at you and say, oh, you're black, mm -hmm. so I have this definition. You have hair like this. I'm, I'm going to define you that way. It's like we want to be identified by our ideas and the things that we bring to the table and the way that we live our lives morally. All of these things matter so much more, but the left doesn't care about that. The left doesn't care about how you live your life or the things that are important to you or the things that actually you do in your everyday life. They care about your intersectionality and whatever race or whatever else you are. Right. It's so reductive. It's why would you want to reduce life down to things that you cannot change? Things like your dialect, things like your skin color, things like your hair and the way that you look. Those are things that are with you. You were born that way. That's all it is. Things that you can change, your intellect, your values, your morals, things that you can actively work on every single day to make yourself a better person. We as conservatives don't care how you look. We don't care what your skin color is. We care that you meet us face to face and you tell us your values and you tell us your morals and hopefully they match up with ours. And that's what we want to see from people we want to see people who are striving to be better people not striving to to uh, reduce other people down to their skin color right if you're white and have bad ideas i'm going to call you a bad ideas exactly. if you're black and have bad ideas i'm going to call it out if you're a trans disabled lesbian and have bad ideas mm -hmm. i'm still going to call out your ideas i don't care about any of that i right. care about what you're saying and what you're offering if you're not offering anything constructive or you aim for the destruction of america i don't care if you're gay black disabled, trans, whatever. Mm -hmm. None of that matters. I'm going to call out your ideas nonetheless because that is what is the most important to me. Right. And they want to talk about this power structure. What power do white people have over black people? What power? What right do they have that you don't? What privilege do they have that you don't? It is non-existent. It is not there. I don't like to hear it. It's reducing people down. And uh, coincidentally, this is a white professor who's sitting in front of a class of all different races telling them because he's white, he has more power than they do and more privilege than they do. It's not true. Listen, I go and I sometimes read the YouTube comments after these streams. Mm -hmm. You guys say way more nice things about Amla <laughs> than you do about me. Okay? If we're talking about white privilege, I don't I don't see it in these comments. I don't okay? See it. You guys are much nicer to Amla than you are to me and Taylor, and we are both white. Just just saying. Okay? Thank sure. you guys. You guys are very sweet. I really appreciate the comments, by the way. <laughs> but what we should really be addressing is not this sort of idea of racial inequity because as we've said time and time again on this stream it does not exist along those lines if we want to talk about people of color if we want to talk about the problems that they're facing we should be talking about crime we should be talking about fatherlessness we should be talking about education there are so many other issues of which we could be spending our time our effort our knowledge on rather than putting people against each other based on their skin color and that leads us to uh, another story that we're going to talk about today and that is the lack of fatherhood and why fathers are necessary. So I'm gonna plug our PragerU five minute video that just came out. Uh, this is with Dennis Prager. We're gonna show this and react to this with you, so. Are fathers necessary? For all of recorded history, the need to explain why fathers are necessary would have been regarded as, well, 
unnecessary. It would have been like explaining why water or air is necessary. I love this guy. But we live at a time in which the obvious is routinely denied. There have been articles in the most prestigious journals denying the importance of fathers. The Atlantic magazine, for example, published an article titled, Are Fathers Necessary? A Paternal Contribution May Not Be As Essential As We Think. The New York Times published a discussion among five intellectuals titled, What Are Fathers For? One of them, Hannah Rosen, an editor at New York Magazine, opened her response by stating, I'm not sure whether a child needs a father. I could give dozens of such examples. I'll just give one more. Huff Post published a piece titled, Fathers Are Not Needed. Look at all these huge mainstream media outlets telling you that you don't need a father. How ridiculous is that sort of utterance that you feel comfortable putting that out into the public space? It makes absolutely no sense. Just on a basic biological level, you should know that having a mother and a father within your household and raising you throughout the duration of your life is better than not having one. Oh, of course. I mean, any of you guys know me. I mean, I grew up with my, without my dad around. He was not there. And so uh, my mom raised me very well by herself with my grandparents and then my older brother was like a, a father to me who was also just a very good influence on me. So luckily I had some more support systems, but I, I would have loved to have had a father. That would have been an amazing thing. I can't, if I'm this successful now, who knows where I'd be if I had a father, right? In the picture with me. So, uh, but it's truly one of the most important things and it, it can't be stressed enough. Yeah. I mean, that's something that Will and I share. I did not have a father in my life up until, well, I had a father in my life up until I was about five or six years old, you could say he was there. Uh, and then he wasn't. And right. Both Will and I came out well on the other end of that, even though it's probably something that we would never wish upon anybody to have that sort of experience. And there are people who deviate from the, the bad outcomes of not having a father in their life. But imagine where you would be had you had a strong male role model. And luckily, Will and I were able to find male role models outside of fatherhood. I had my grandparents, my grandfather and my grandmother who were there to sort of pick up the slack of not having a father. And Will had his brother and other support systems within his family. So it is very important that even if you don't have a father, you have male role models. And we're not saying it's not possible to live without a father. Like right. if you don't have a father around for some sort of circumstance, you can still make it in America. That's the beauty of America, mm -hmm. that you have that opportunity. But I mean, you see a 10% increase in kids living with single father or single parent households, you're going to see a 17% increase in juvenile crime. Right. I mean, all these things. If a, if a dad leaves before the age of five for a girl, she's eight times more likely to have teen pregnancy. Right. Kids in single parent households are two times more likely to commit suicide or attempt suicide. They're in poorer health. They eat less. They're more depressed. Uh, I mean, the suicide rates have gone up in just so much. 74% for young boys, like 240% for young girls over the last, uh, since the 1970s. In the 1970s, Two parent households were about 90% of all households. Right. Now that number is about 70%. And that's not even including biological together. That's like 70% including stepfathers and everything like that. So yeah, it's incredibly important that you have fathers in the household. I mean, it truly is the, the, the hallmark of a healthy society to have both parents together in the household. I am actually under the impression that people get divorced too easily. Mm -hmm. I think people get divorced way too easily. I agree. I, I think that uh, like there's this, this thing about like, Maybe I haven't been married, so maybe I'm talking out of my ass a little bit. I'm just going to say. But, like, <laughs> let's say, like, you you are with someone and you guys kind of grow apart and you have children and all that. It's like you got to work it out. You have to find some way to work it out for your kids if you guys feel like you are growing apart. Don't just have divorce be the first answer. And I feel like that is for a lot of people. Like, love isn't going to just be so romantic all the time as you get older. Yeah, I mean, we've made divorce easy in America specifically, and we've made single motherhood especially incentivized here in this country. And Jordan Peterson talks a lot about this, that if you are struggling with your marriage and you have children, you should pursue every single avenue that you can pursue to avoid divorce before you go down that lane. It's 100%. just what you should do. I agree. Let's keep hearing what Dennis has to say here. Fortunately, this dismissal of the importance of fathers is not universal. In a 2008 Father's Day speech a few months before his election as President of the United States, Barack Obama said, fathers are critical to the foundation of each family. That they are teachers and coaches, they are mentors and role models, they are examples of success, and they are the men who constantly push us toward it. What makes his comments particularly noteworthy 
is that Barack Obama grew up without a father. Both boys and girls need fathers. We'll begin with boys. A boy has no built-in understanding about how to be a man, meaning a good and responsible man. Male nature is wild, most obviously regarding sex and violence. If a boy does not have a father who models how a man controls himself, he will likely not know how to control himself, let alone want to. That's why most males in prison for violent crimes grew up without a father. After days of riots in the UK in 2011, quite like the 2020 riots in America, Christina Adone wrote a column for the London Telegraph, whose title says it all. London riots, absent fathers have a lot to answer for. In the column, she wrote, the majority of rioters are gang members. Like the overwhelming majority of youth offenders behind bars, these gang members have one thing in common, no father at home. Right. And that's an issue that we don't want to talk about, especially when it comes to the black community, although it's a problem across all races here in America, is that we want to talk about the gang violence. We want to talk about drugs. We want to talk about the influence of things like uh, horrible black culture, hip hop culture, things like that. But a lot of that stems from not having a father. Right now, 64 percent of black children here in America are growing up in a single parent household. Seventy five percent of those are born out of wedlock within their within their uh, world. And it makes no sense to me that we can't just talk about this foundational issue that is the root cause of a lot of these problems. Well, there are problems in the culture. Like one thing with like hip hop music, like you and I, we both like hip hop music. But one thing, right. like if you're living in the hood, I talk to a lot of black people about this, like, and you don't have a father growing up. It's like, you can still be a good person, like listen to hip hop music, listen to rap music, whatever. And you can kind right. of separate the things that are within those songs from real life right but it's like when you're growing up without a father and then you see that in your culture and it's like you know those rappers who are saying these horrible things in some of these songs they become like your father right they become like your role models like right. who do i look up to oh i look up to jay-z i look up to these these other rappers that, that are putting out these songs that are about my life in the hood and like what it's like growing up and so i look up to them instead of actually having a real role model who's there for me when i need him so that's kind of the problem with the culture with that is like you can separate yourself from these types of avenues, from this type of culture, but only if you have the right foundation first to make that happen. Right. Being a part of a gang is a life is a lifelong relationship. Having a father is a lifelong relationship. If you strip somebody of their their father, I, I can't see why you would not find some sort of solace and some sort of comfort by being a part of a gang. That is exactly what happens. Yeah, it is. Well, let's see what Dennis has to say. Good things. There's no question that many mothers have done an excellent job raising a boy without their son's father. But common sense alone suggests that a mother simply cannot model what a boy should be any more than a man can model to a girl what a woman should be. And then there is the issue of controlling boys and their wild natures. Again, there are mothers who are able to do this. But if a boy is at all difficult, as so many are, as he gets older, most mothers will find it more and more difficult to control their son because unruly boys listen to their fathers much more than they listen to their mothers, which is precisely why most violent criminals grew up in fatherless homes. They obviously did not listen to their mothers. As regards daughters, the father is the man girls learn to relate to. Without a father to relate to and bond with, there are at least two destructive consequences. First, she will not know how to choose a man wisely. She will not know how a man should treat her. And she may well end up with a man who mistreats her. Second, to fulfill her desire to bond with a man, as primally yearning in most women as bonding with a woman is in most men, she will go from man to man. Girls without fathers in their lives are far more likely to be sexually promiscuous and to begin sexual activity at an earlier age. All very, very true. And it speaks to an even larger problem that growing up in a fatherless household creates a vicious, vicious cycle of recreating that very same problem. If you grow up without that father influence, like you said, you don't know how to look for a man, a man which you would hope would emulate your father. And then 
that same thing happens to you. And when you grow up without a father, particularly as a woman, you have an increased likelihood of having an abortion. You have an increased likelihood of an unexpected pregnancy. And again, an increased likelihood of also being a single mother. So it is a cycle that never ends and why it is so important that we start to incentivize having both a mother and a father in the household. But it's not incentivized. I know. When you can just get money from the state, it's not incentivized. When you don't right. have to work and you can continue to stay at home, it's not incentivized. When people, when the feminist movement tells you that you don't need no man, you can work until you're 80 and just be totally happy without a man. Right. Like, of course, that's going to be bad for people. That's going to be bad for people. Women have been getting unhappier for generations now. And in the 1970s, they were happier than men. They were happier than men in the 1970s. And now they are surveys show that they are more unhappy than men. And it's because, listen, women, you want to work and do your thing. That's totally fine. Right. But I guarantee you that you will be happier in a home where you have a husband and kids than you working some career your entire life. You right. will be happier. And that's a conversation that I think needs to be had because there's this whole campaign on the left to tell women that going out and pursuing a career, pursuing corporate interests or whatever your career may be is more fulfilling than it is to have children. And that is simply not the case. And it may be the case for a very obscure outlier of women, but it is not the case for all women. And I do not like to hear the rhetoric that pursuing a career, pursuing your own self-interest is somehow more valuable than having a family. And you can teach women that that's okay. And that's what it means to be feminine, but it's not. And if you are a woman who is going to choose to pursue your career rather than pursuing marriage and a family, that is totally fine. But don't sell it to me as if that is what it means to be feminine in this country because it is not you are doing something that is traditionally masculine do not teach it to me as if that is somehow feminist and marriage is better for people in marriages you see the couples drink and smoke less they do community service together and volunteer more they're healthier right. they live longer they make more money when they're married like all of these things are good things the feminist movement telling people that you don't need to be married, you can have as much sex as you want. I mean, I went to the slut walk in Los Angeles. If any of you guys have seen that video, I should repost that video. It's one of my funniest videos of seeing these people. But they said that being a slut is empowering and all of these different stuff. The feminist movement is teaching that and it is truly evil. It is right. evil to tell people something is ev something is good when it is actually evil. They're telling you that horrible, terrible things are good, disguising it as that. And I want to see the studies that come out 30, 40 years down the line when we have women who have dedicated themselves, their lives, their knowledge, their passion to nothing but corporate interests or whatever their career may be. And at the very end of that road, they have no children. They have no family. They are not married. What sort of happiness is that? It's not just something that it's like men are sitting here like rubbing our hands like we can't wait to control these women. No. It's like it's better for everyone. It's better for men. It's better for women. It's better for kids if families stay together and they choose to be together right it is so much better for everyone like all of these problems that we have in america do you think that kids will come out of college as socialist and as leftist as they do now if they had good family structures growing up right of course not they're going to be much better off if you have a strong foundation behind you like a family then you're not going to feel like i need all these handouts all these benefits all these all these leftist dogma around me like i feel like i can actually do things on my own you know, like have a family structure will make all of these problems disappear. It is the number one thing that we have to fix in this country to make people's lives better. <laughs> Right. And you have to ask yourself, you know, why is the left telling you that you don't need to have a family? Why is the left telling you that as a woman, you shouldn't prioritize marriage? You should focus on your own self-interest and be a selfish individual for the rest of your life. And it is because the left knows that a family unit is the strongest bond that you can have within your nation. And when you have a family, that is all that you think about. You start to view the world differently. You start to view the world through a lens of which will be best for your children, best for your children children best for your great grandchildren and that changes your views on a fundamental level and quite frankly it leads you more to the conservative side the more traditional american view of how we live our lives and that is why the left is disincentivizing you having children and telling you that you don't need them yeah that's simply it now somebody knew this somebody was on the track of this and i kind of want to talk about this video here i believe it's from the 90s or maybe the early 2000s but this was just a brilliant rant uh, made by this uh older black guy talking about this issue kids have to kill each other before we see there have already been thousands thousands of beautiful gifted kids whose lives are over 
There will be no future for them, no tomorrow. All their great potential is wasted forever. These are our own kids killing each other. Our own kids are doing what 300 years of slavery couldn't do, what the Ku Klux Klan couldn't do, and what all the ugly racism we face for generations couldn't do. They're threatening our spirit, breaking our hearts, and destroying us from within. Now, Martin Luther King didn't die for that, not to see our own children threatening the survival of our people. Malcolm X didn't die for that. Now, I know how hard it is out there. I know how hopeless it feels, the epidemic of drugs, the lack of jobs, the deprivation and killing in our community, and, almost, and it seems like almost nothing is being done about it. I know that. But killing ourselves is not the answer. And parents, we must take responsibility. You know, we have to take our children back and gain control. It is our individual responsibility to do this, to get our children back. We cannot let this slaughter continue. We got to go on together. And we have to live to realize the promise of our great struggle for all of us. If you or someone you love has been a victim of a violent crime and need information, you call the National Victim Center. He sums it up very, very well. Less than less than two minutes and he's telling you the exact problem and what we need to do to fix it. And these are problems of which we can all recognize. Although the left would have it scrubbed from the media, the left would have it scrubbed from their headlines that these sort of problems are what the black community especially is facing in America, although it is happening in all races. But the root of the problem is a lack of parental guidance, a lack of fathers in the household. He said it perfectly. He said individual responsibility. Right. He telling people people don't like to be told that they have to actually do something about their lives especially if their lives are all screwed up mm -hmm. no one likes to be told that it's their fault or that they did something wrong it makes us feel bad we don't want to hear that something is our fault but him putting it there perfectly with a heartfelt thing and telling you that you need to take individual responsibility you okay. need to take control of your kids take control of the situation is the exact message that we need to be getting out to all americans right now Right. And conservatives get a lot of hate when they bring up these issues. Again, particularly when it pertains to the black community, when we bring up the issues of black and black crime, we bring up the issues of crime, of uh, gang violence. We bring up the issues of, of drug related violence and we get a lot of hate. We, they say, oh, it's because you hate black people. It's because you want to portray black people as being innately born violent or innately born uh, a drug addicts or into addiction and that is not the case whatsoever and again he says in this we are doing more harm for our own communities than did the people who incited systemic racism did the people who who enslaved black Americans within this country. We are doing more harm now. We are killing more now than ever before. Look at the numbers coming out of New York and Chicago. It is absolutely ridiculous and it can all be solved if somebody would sit down and have a discussion about it, but nobody wants to talk about it. No, they don't. And that's really sad because again, it's the left's agenda and the left would rather push their agenda about everything being racist and how terrible white people are and that they have fantasies about shooting white people in the head instead of actually looking at real issues and saying, how can we fix this? Oh, what's that? When you add more police to a city, it actually reduces crime and communities get better. Why, why can't we focus on that? No, because the police are racist. I, I, all of these things, they don't make any sense. We have to push back against the left at every single choice chance that we have. Right. If you think police killings of, of black Americans is anywhere near the amount that are dying to drugs and gun violence, you are out of your mind. But the left would have you believe that. The left would tell you that the real problem for black Americans is the white man, the white capitalist, systemic racism. That is not the case whatsoever. There are cultural issues that need to be discussed and they need to be handled and they are not being handled. And until that is done, nothing is going to happen. People are going to keep dying at the same rate. Homicide is going to be one of the top five reasons that young black men die in this country. We have to sit down and we have to talk about it. 
Anyways, <laughs> yeah, <we laughs> that do. is my, my little rant on that. And a, a big problem as to why we are not creating strong marriages and strong families is that now the left wants to skew what it means to be a strong man, what it means to be a good woman. And back in the day, we had strong men. And we did celebrate this and, and commemorate this uh, yesterday on D-Day. And I want to show you a little video talking about, uh, you know, the true lives that were lost on D-Day on the American side. It's some people... Who didn't say anything about D-Day. Yes, we had you some know, politicians. Some people, some people you'd think would be very important to say right. something. Right. you think you would want to, uh, you mention know. Mention it. Just mention it, maybe. <laughs> not even say, not even say thank you. Just mention it. Yeah. Anyways, we're going to mention it. Here's a video. <laughs> a day later, too. The average lifespan of an American is 80 years. And an 80-year-old today was 10 when World War II ended. Four when it began. A soldier who saw battle would have to be in his late 80s, at least today. Generals, political leaders, the decision makers of the war, few are still with us. And over the past few decades, we've seen authors and filmmakers rush to capture stories from survivors before this connection of memory is lost. This project is not about individual war stories, and it's not about survivors. We're going to tally up the tens of millions of people whose lives are cut short by the war, and see how these numbers stack up to other wars in history, including trends in recent conflicts. We'll be counting soldiers and civilians separately. Each of these figures represents 1,000 people who died. Civilians were of all walks of life. Whereas military deaths were almost entirely men, the average age was about 23. In most battles, for every 1,000 soldiers killed, there are more than 1,000 who were injured. The word casualty can be confusing because in military speak, it often includes both deaths and injuries, and anything else that takes a soldier out of service. Here, we're just counting the deaths, and we'll begin with American soldiers. Over 400,000 died. Most of the deaths occurred in the European theater, fighting the Nazis. And about a quarter were in the Pacific, fighting the Japanese. When you put them on the timeline, you see that casualties were the heaviest at the end of the war. The war began on September 1st, 1939, but the U.S. wasn't willing to join the fight until Pearl Harbor, two years in. The deaths increased drastically on D-Day, when the Allies invaded Normandy. One of the most tragic moments of the war was on D-Day at Omaha Beach, where 2,500 Americans fell. So about the same number of U.S. soldiers died on this single beach landing as the entire 13 years of the recent war in Afghanistan. Crazy, crazy. to think about. Yeah. Jinx. <laughs> Jinx. That is, I, I Real recommend. Men. Real yeah. men. Real men. Like you said, the average age being 23 years old. Look around at the 23-year-old men that we have in our generation today. Do you see that? Because I don't see that. And no. maybe I'm maybe I'm looking through a different lens than you are, but we are not as manly, we are not as feminine as women as we were back in the day. We are as feminine as women. Very sad. <laughs> the men are. The men are. The yeah, men the are men feminine. Are. Yeah. <laughs> the women aren't. No. It's it's incredibly sad to see that this is a state of our country right now. And because we've had so much peacetime in America, so much peacetime really throughout the world right. since World War II, I mean it's it's made soft men. It's mm -hmm. made men who don't know how to stand up for anything. They don't have anything to really stand up for. And that's a right. sad thing because that means that our country collapses. That means leftism takes over our country. I right. mean, it's like ancient Rome. It's the exact same way. It's incredibly sad to see. And real masculinity through fatherhood needs to be brought back. Right. And just a big thank you to anybody who has served in our military. Uh, I'm sure that day strikes hard for a lot of people, a lot of American families, whether or not these were people who fought in World War II, which probably many of which are not around much anymore. But uh, just, I don't even know what to say. 
it's it's a sacrifice of which I cannot imagine. The ultimate sacrifice. So thank you. Any veterans watching or anyone who is in the family of veterans, thank you so much for everything. We appreciate it. We mention it definitely. Yep. And if you get the chance, go look at this video. It's called The Fallen of World War II. It's crazy. You do not fully understand the scope of, of what happened in World War II until you watch somebody break it down like this and really tell you the numbers of what actually happened. And looking at this, we watched this earlier and we looked at the Soviet deaths. Right. Holy cow. Holy smokes. Tens so of millions. So many people right. died. Right. It's wild how many people died in that war in just a sh few short years crazy yeah crazy it's, it's weird i don't think anybody in our generation at least around us has something of which they would die for do you think people would i don't know i don't I, I don't think that if we if china was to go to war with us or russia or something like that i don't think there would be many men in america who are saying yes i'm ready excuse me i'm ready to defend this country right especially not at the average age of 23 years old right we oh are, yeah or even younger like no right. definitely not we have definitely uh created a new generation of men, a new generation of women. I, I said the other day that right now in our generation, we have uh, a bunch of men who are encouraged to be substandard men and a bunch of women who are encouraged to be substandard men. That yeah. is, that's where we're at. We're gonna become this homogenous blob of people who have no interest, no national pride and no nothing. No, bring back American pride. Bring right. back American nationalism. So if you're out there and you're listening and you are a strong conservative, you support America and you want to share your values, please do please do so. Whether that's somebody who disagrees with you or somebody who agrees with you, please start to share your values because we cannot let these things die uh, because it's happening all over the world right now. It is happening right here in the United States as we have given you evidence time and time again. So please say something. Teach your kids these values so they do not die with us. Yeah. Don't let your little boys be soft. Teach them to be hard men, okay? Yes. Teach them to be men. Teach your women to grow up and be strong as well, but but with family values, and we will fix this country. We will fix this country. We appreciate all of you guys watching. If you First step to sharing your conservative values is sharing this stream. You can share it here on YouTube. You can share it here on Facebook, whatever it is. You can also share any of the clips that you see that we post on Instagram, Twitter as well. If you're not following us there, me and Amla and PragerU, we really appreciate it. We do this every single weekday at 2.30 p.m. PST. That's 5.30 p.m. Eastern and... Guys, make sure you go to PrayGear.com slash donate. We are a nonprofit. Help us out. I think that's about all we got for today, guys. Yep. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye. Peace.